the um, I am real. I'm Judy Hickman Davis. Good morning. It's almost lunchtime. I always feel like we should like stretch and wake up. I'm really happy. I'm a former student of Dr. L Russell Lindsay, and I'm really happy to be able to introduce the James Russell Lindsay uh, Distinguished Lecture for this year's ICLAM Forum. I'm going to start, so I'm not going to bore you professionally, but I could do that if you wanted me to. I'm just going to start and remind everyone about where this lecture series came from. I promise it's only two minutes. Um, Dr. Lindsay was a pioneer in research to improve the health of laboratory animals and their use as research models for human disease. He was board certified in both ACVP and ACLAM in 1967, and in 1968 he started the Comparative Medicine Department at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he served for 34 years. He served the college, ACLAM College, as president in 1970, and in an era when there were very few reference, um, current references for our specialty, he helped pioneer the ACLAM Blue Book series for laboratory animals, and he actually co-edited the first, um, the first rat, laboratory rat book in 1979. The James Russell Lindsay Distinguished Lecture Series was established in recognition of the heritage of our college in education, training, and research. The lectureship recognizes scientific leaders who, like Russell Lindsay, have made outstanding contributions in comparative medicine, laboratory animal medicine, and animal models of human disease, mentoring young scientists and all other accomplishments that represent laboratory animal medicine. I'm very pleased that this year's speaker is Dr. Joseph Mankowski. He's the director of the Department of Molecular and Comparative Pathology and Vice Provost for Animal Research at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Mankowski started as an equine veterinarian before joining the program at Johns Hopkins where he completed a residency in comparative pathology and a PhD in human genetics and molecular biology. He is a diplomat of ACVP and has authored more than 100 papers on the pathogenesis, neuropathology, and therapy of viruses such as HIV, SIV, Zika, and SARS-CoV-2. He is the principal investigator for an NIH T32 grant that funds biomedical research training for veterinarians and has personally mentored numerous students. I want to end with just sharing with you a few excerpts from his former students and colleagues about his contributions to their career. Let's see, Dr. Mankowski's mentorship extended beyond my tenure as a postdoctoral fellow. He made the connections that allowed me to obtain my first professional position as a laboratory animal veterinarian. I truly count Dr. Mankowski's teaching and mentorship as critical for my professional development both as a scientist and as a laboratory animal veterinarian. Joe doesn't work for himself, he works for the scientific comparative medicine community. So join me in congratulating Dr. Joe Mankowski as this year's James Russell Lindsay Distinguished Lecturer as he talks about horses to hybrids, the first 130 years of comparative medicine at Johns Hopkins. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Judy. And again, this is a real honor and privilege to deliver the Russ Lindsay Lecture this year uh, in honor of Russ's amazing career. The American Veterinary Medical Association describes comparative medicine as the discipline in which the similarities and differences in biology among animal species are studied to enhance our understanding of the mechanisms of both human and animal disease. To paraphrase the second part of this description and the AVMA definition, comparative medicine catalyzes the transition of basic science knowledge into clinical applications. This central role as a catalyst is the essence of comparative medicine, emphasizing that our intellectual engagement combined with our veterinary expertise drives biomedical research echoing a theme we just heard in the previous panel discussion. 
For this talk, I've divided the history of comparative medicine into three parts. The founding of Johns Hopkins Medicine and the use of comparative approaches from 1893 into the 1900s. And then the actual formal beginnings of comparative medicine at Johns Hopkins in the 1960s that I term the Russ Lindsay and Ed Melby era. And then finally, uh, bring us up to current day today, what comparative medicine looks like at Johns Hopkins in the spirit of hybrid and beyond. Johns Hopkins University was founded as America's first research university in 1876, thanks to the generosity of Johns Hopkins, a well-to-do Baltimore merchant. The Johns Hopkins Hospital opened 13 years later after the university in 1889. John Shaw Billings, a physician who served in the Union Army during the Civil War, including a field hospital duty at Gettysburg, ensured that the hospital was a true marvel of its day elegant design capped off by the central dome, an innovative ventilation system that was intended to control spread of disease, particularly airborne pathogens, and he went to the extreme point of actually even banning elevators in the building, which seems a little bit retro in its design, but he insisted that patients were carried from wards to wards um, by stairs to prevent transmission of disease, insisted on a lot of sunlight in addition to the ventilation, things that he had garnered during his career in the Army in the service. Uh, the hospital was even future-proofed. Uh, it had electrical wiring and phone service, even though the hospital could not yet be connected to the world. And this is back in the day when phones actually were connected to a wire, and the wire went out through the system and things like that. Um, there were three R's at the beginning of Hopkins. Uh, the first was residents. So doctors in training lived in the hospital and were known as residents, hence the origin of this term. The hospital also had an octagonal ward and where teams of physicians and trainees learned at the bedside of the patients. And hence, this teaching experience became to known as rounds. Finally, revenue was a challenge. Sound familiar today? This is especially for realizing Hopkins' vision of a teaching hospital based in the School of Medicine his initial gift to Hopkins of $7 million fell far short of establishing the School of Medicine and Teaching Hospital thanks to a crash in railroad stocks. An extraordinary, tenacious, and visionary woman, Mary Elizabeth Garrett, a Baltimore native, came to the rescue. She and her colleagues, members of the Friday Night Women's Group in Baltimore, raised $500,000, including many contributions from them personally, to launch the Johns Hopkins University Medical School. Along the way, this group of women, led by Mary Elizabeth Garrett, shrewdly, shrewdly negotiated important conditions of this gift. One was that entering medical students had to have an undergraduate education. They had to have advanced training in biology, physics, and chemistry, uh, a working knowledge of French and German. Uh, and their standards were so high that William Osler, who you'll meet soon, the founding physician and chief of Hopkins, said, thank goodness I got into Hopkins as a doctor. I would never get in as a student. And I, you know, I, I thought of that when I read this quote, and I said, geez, that's how I feel today now. Thank goodness I'm not trying to enter a training program because the sophistication, expertise, uh, knowledge of our entering DVMs is extraordinary. Uh, and so, um, yeah, a theme that continues to this day for sure. The, the other condition um, that uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett and her uh, collective group insisted on was admission of women on equal terms with men. And this was met with a great deal of resistance, but they persisted, and Hopkins kept upping the ante, and they kept persisting, and finally they reached an agreement where, in fact, three women were admitted in the inaugural class in the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in 1893. And this, too, was a marvel of its day. And it's just incredible to think that it took almost 80 years before women were admitted for undergraduate training at the Johns Hopkins University in 1970. That's how extraordinary this accomplishment was in the uh, 1890s. John Singer's sergeant painted Mary Elizabeth Garrett's portrait. <clears throat> and she had to go to London, actually, to, be, to have the sitting for this portrait. Uh, and uh, this portrait now hangs in the Welch Library at Johns Hopkins. Many people who have trained or served in our community at Hopkins have seen this portrait. And alongside um, her portrait is another Singer Sargent painting of 
the founding four doctors of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Uh, these were uh, William Henry Welch, who was uh, the founding dean and the first pathologist and chief at Johns Hopkins. William Osler, who I mentioned, who was the initial founding physician in chief, considered by many to be the founding father of modern medicine. Howard Kelly, who was chief of gynecology. And back here in the shadows, uh, William Halstead, who was the inaugural surgeon in chief at Johns Hopkins. Welch, Osler, and Halstead were all advocates for comparative medicine approaches at Johns Hopkins, having learned from Virchow and others, some of them even traveling to Europe to learn from Virchow. Virchow famously said back in that day that between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. And this really was the ethos of comparative medicine approaches at that time. A counter to this came from Koch of Koch's postulate fame, who said that gentlemen, Never forget that mice are not human beings. And again, how often do we still hear these comments too today? So here I've, uh, I've crafted uh, Virko's triad, the comparative ver version at Johns Hopkins, and it really revolves around three of these four founding positions, Welch, Osler, and Halstead. William Henry Welch, shown again on the lower left in this blow of this picture, was extremely interested in hog cholera. Uh, I've never found out why, but even uh, at, during his tenure at Hopkins, he continued to publish and investigate hog cholera. Uh, there are multiple uh, files in his archives in our uh, historical library talking about his interest in uh, work on hog cholera. And here you see a publication on hog cholera and swine plague that was published in the Veterinary Journal and Annals of Comparative Pathology in December of 1894. When I looked at this, I was really intrigued because not only was Welch the author on this, this professor of pathology, but there was another author, A.W. Clement, V.S. An affiliation was listed as the pathological laboratory of the Johns Hopkins University. And I figured out that V.S. meant veterinary surgeon. And I was really wondering, you know, who was Clement? What was his story to? Um, and as I dug further in the archives, I found yet another publication coming out of Hopkins. This one on pulmonary tuberculosis in a lion, published in the Johns Hopkins Hospital Bulletin in April of 1990. And again, here we have an MD pathologist, William McCallum, publishing with A.W. Clement, again, uh, V.S. from Baltimore, Maryland, on this case of a lion that uh, died, that was traveling in the Baltimore area as part of a, the famous Hagenbach animal menagerie that toured through the country, too. So as many things uh, in Hopkins history uh, will tell us, all these paths converged uh, on the Clement story with William Osler. So again, I've mentioned uh, uh, William Osler's fame. He was the one who insisted that actually the students learned uh, patient side uh, and really transform medicine with that teaching approach. So before he came to Hopkins and in his original posting, Osler was a member of the medical faculty at McGill in Montreal. He also was co-appointed in the Montreal Veterinary College, and he taught both medical and veterinary students alike uh, on content, sharing specimens, pathology, and uh, pathogenesis of disease. Leon Sanders wrote a biographical history of veterinary pathology from which the previous uh, portrait was, uh, was picked from, and uh, he dedicated this book in the memory of Sir William Osler noting that at the Montreal Veterinary College, he was the first teacher of veterinary pathology in North America. Uh, Harvey Cushing, of Cushing's uh, disease fame, uh, wrote a biography of Osler, and here's a great anecdote from that. This, in Montreal, the students were used by the professor, Osler, from time to time for his own dire purposes. In Ogden, a medical student who shared a dwelling with Osler one day was sent to perform an autopsy on a horse that had died from some mysterious nervous ailment. It necessitated the removal intact and in one piece of the animal's brain and spinal cord. A difficult enough procedure even for one more experienced and it took Ogden nearly all day. Now Jenny Haupt can comment now on the authenticity of this approach. Not knowing how to dispose of the trophy it being late afternoon, he took it home and proudly laid it out full length in the family bathtub where unfortunately it was first discovered by the landlord who was furiously angry. 
Luckily, Osler came in time to save from harm student and specimen and pacify the landlord by agreeing to take the first bath. <laughs> I never heard if that was in formalin or water or what, but it must have been interesting at the time, too. So Osler worked on a number of diseases in animals, including verminous bronchitis in dogs, publishing this in The Veterinarian in 1877. He worked on the pathology of so-called pig typhoid, published that in Annals of Hair of Pathology in 78, and also published on echinococcus disease in America. And finally, I hit gold in my search for A.W. Clement, finding this article by both Osler and Clement uh, discussing parasites in the pork supply of Montreal. Uh, no offense intended to Canada here. Uh, this was published in 1893. So here I close the loop on climate. It turns out he was a student at the Montreal Veterinary College and a protege of Osler's. Um, he came actually from training at Harvard to attend veterinary college at Montreal Veterinary College, which was the precursor of, of Guelph of the Ontario Veterinary College today. I haven't figured out how Clement now ended up in Baltimore from Montreal, but he in fact was a large animal practitioner in Baltimore. He was affiliated with the pathology department at Hopkins, and uh, he helped found the American Veterinary Medical Association too during his career too. So another true leader uh, who espoused comparative medicine approaches. Uh, Philoroides osleri, or Oslerus osleri, uh, remains a significant pathogen is today, uh, long after Osler's discovery. And here's a report uh, on an outbreak in some cases published in veterinary parasitology from a team in Wyoming in 2011, too. So maybe this could be good boards fodder coming up. Thomas Cameron, uh, one of Osler's biographers, wrote uh, a great synthesis of Osler's career in the comparative space. Osler played the major part in initiating the greatest revolution in the teaching and practice of medicine, both human and veterinary. He had joined the laboratory to the clinic to help end empiricism. It's a high praise indeed. Um, so I mentioned before in the portrait done by John Singer Sargent of the founding four physicians at Hopkins, William Halstead is in the back here, and he's in the shadows. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and uh, I would never wonder, I, you know, many people have wondered whether there was any intent in this positioning or lighting for Halstead, because he was certainly the most enigmatic of all the founders of Hopkins Medicine. Here he is at his retreat in North Carolina with his family friends, all of his dogs, who he truly loved over time, too. When he came to Hopkins, he was prohibited from operating on patients in the hospital because he faced a personal challenge, addiction to cocaine and uh, morphine uh, from his time in the clinics, uh, et cetera, in New York City. And so during this period of probation, um, he worked extremely hard in his research lab using dog models to transform the practice of surgery. One of the techniques that he worked on was uh, really refining robust techniques for intestinal end-to-end -end anastomosis and uh, for um, high-grade wound healing in dogs that were truly transformative. He had a number of other novel methods uh, that included aseptic techniques, careful meticulous tissue handling, and complete medical records for the dogs before he finally started to operate on people as well. And uh, there's a marvelous biography uh, about Halstead called Genius on the Edge by Gerald Ember that's really interesting to read as well. Anna is the most famous dog in Johns Hopkins history. In the 1940s, she played a critical role in the development of the surgical techniques to treat tetralogy of Fallot in human and child patients. An amazing team consisting of Vivian Thomas, an extraordinary surgeon without any formal medical education, who rose from being a carpenter to become the director of the experimental surgery lab directed by Alfred Blaylock, the surgeon in chief, uh, was a crucial part of this team. So Vivian Thomas, uh, Alfred Blaylock, a surgical partners, paired with Helen Tosic, a pediatric cardiologist, who actually had severe hearing difficulties to the extent she could not escalt with her stethoscope and used her fingers to actually palpate and identify various uh, cardiac um, uh, malformations in children. It's another extraordinary story about uh, using your extended senses. 
So th um, they worked together to develop a subclavian artery pulmonary artery shunt using the dog model, and Anna was one of the animals in these studies. The surgical techniques pioneered in the dog model culminated in successful treatment of thousands of so-called blue babies. Anna lived for 14 years after her surgical procedure at Hopkins in the lab, and this portrait of Anna now hangs in the lobby of our department. I highly recommend Vivian Thomas's autobiography, Partners of the Heart, to learn about his struggles and successes uh, in a time of uh, overt segregation in America. It's not standing read. Vivian Thomas wrote this about Anna the dog. Anna, dear soul, became the mascot of the lab after, the, after her contribution. Her caretaker saw it and he took her out each morning that she was let from her cage and allowed to come upstairs to the surgical Ontarian lab where she would mingle with the personnel until her mealtime around 1 p.m. Everyone in the lab knew her and was very fond of her. Although her age was not known, it was obvious that she reached ripe old age as her trips down the uh, corridors and halls slowed over the years and she spent more of her time sleeping in a corner that she had chosen for that purpose written by Vivian Thomas in 1975. There's another really interesting dog story at Hopkins about a decade later in the 1950s, following Thomas Blaylock and Taussig's work. It's known at Hopkins as the elevator story. William Cohen Hoven was a professor of electrical engineering, and he worked on the development of defibrillators. His model that he used was induction of cardiac arrest in dogs using low voltage stimulation inducing essentially V-fib in these animals too. Uh, one day they were working on a dog and the subject and unexpectedly it went into cardiac arrest. And this is actually in the building now named for Blaylock, the Blaylock building, which has the notoriously uh, slowest elevators in Hopkins history. So the dog was on one floor, it went into arrest. The defibrillator was seven floors away and it was only connected by this incredibly inefficient elevator system. And the thing weighed over 200 pounds. It was mounted in some huge wooden cabinet, and it was incredibly difficult. So they couldn't get them together in the moment. But they previously had had a very serendipitous finding that when they actually applied uh, the electronic paddles of the defibrillator to the dogs in their studies, they saw that they could raise the dog's blood pressure by the external chest compression. And so while one member of the team, Guy Knickerbocker, raced up those seven floors in the stairwell, uh, grabbed the defibrillator, waited forever for this packed elevator full of patients and medical staff to clear enough to get this down to the dog. For 20 minutes, um, the team maintained external chest compression uh, in, in this canine patient. And it was the first time that they ever really saw that they could do this over time too. And this was without ventilation as well. They finally moved the uh, defibrillator to dog side and uh, successfully converted the dog back to a sinus rhythm. The next day, the dog was perfectly normal too. So uh, they took us to the lead and they still worked to develop further refinements using their dog model and how external chest compression really could maintain cardiac function with uh, severe arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. And uh, I, you know, in one of those great coincidences, across Baltimore on the other side of town at City Hospital, there was a team actually working on mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, you know, you know, testing the hypothesis that air in its own right was sufficient, or breathed air was sufficient to actually provide ventilatory support too. And so uh, with a, a, an individual in the Baltimore Fire Department who was hearing both sides of these stories actually had that eureka moment. He said, hey, why don't you guys talk to each other, get together. And that really was the genesis and a formation of CPR as a technique. And so then they uh, rapidly worked together to develop this and they published it in 1960 in the Journal of American Medical Association uh, to advance its widespread use to humans and it saved millions of lives too. And uh, again, it was really this serendipitous observation uh, um, uh, in their dog model for defibrillator development too. Dogs weren't the only animals at Johns Hopkins, of course, in the 1900s. Um, there were many rhesus monkeys at Hopkins from the 1920 onward. And these were principally used by the Carnegie Institute of Embryology to study successive embryonic development in a primate species, something they certainly couldn't do in people, and they really could not uh, get the same information from any rodent model. And this is a book, The Anatomy of the Rhesus Monkey, published in 1933, that actually has pictures and text about the Johns Hopkins rhesus macaque facility that had already been in existence for over a decade as well. 
So um, I'm finally coming up uh, to the Russ Lindsay phase here as we close in on lunch. Um, the formal beginnings of comparative medicine as we would define it today began at Hopkins in the 1960s, and I call this the Russ Lindsay era. It's when Russ Lindsay and Ed Melby, as you'll see, worked closely together to really uh, set the foundation for where we are still today. So 1962 in particular was the pivotal year at Johns Hopkins. The Carnegie Institute uh, moved from the School of Medicine campus in East Baltimore a few miles away to the Homewood campus. They took many of the rhesus macaques with them and they took many of the managerial and animal care staff as well. So all of a sudden the School of Medicine was left in a real bind. They had rhesus macaques still at the School of Medicine. Many, for example, were still being used for polio studies by David Bodium and they were rife with intercurrent disease, TB, sugallosis, and all the viruses you suspect and I'm not gonna mention. So it was a real, real challenge. So um, in talking with uh, friends in New York City, Tommy Turner, the Dean of the School of Medicine, had heard about this person, Ed Melby, and he was fascinated because he heard that he might be interested in moving from private practice into an academic medical setting and was investigating a possible PhD in pharmacology at Yale at the time. So uh, Tommy Turner uh, dug up his phone number and uh, gave him a call. Uh, he uh, was in, in mixed practice at the time in, in Vermont. As a native of Vermont, he attended the University of Pennsylvania for undergraduate training, received his DVM from the New York State College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell, and then he was in mixed animal practice uh, in Vermont for the period of 1954 to 1962. And then in 1962, he was in fact recruited to be the director of the Primate Center by Dean Turner. So years later, we had a letter from Ed um, describing these early days in this recruitment process. And it was sort of really interesting. So I didn't hear anything about signing bonuses or the other benefits we were talking about early today and, and things like that. But uh, the exchange you know, went to the uh, tune of this. Uh, you know, Ed told Tommy Turner, I don't know anything about monkeys. I don't know anything about these. I'm a mixed animal practitioner. And uh, Turner, of course, was confident he could come and learn. And, uh, you know, Melby had a family, he had a very busy practice, but he looked out the window and it was snowing in Vermont still. And he was thinking, you know what, maybe I should think about this a little bit. And his final question to Turner on that phone call, as Ed writes, was, where is Johns Hopkins? <laughs> and so began a great relationship. Now, Ed was really, really lucky when he arrived at Johns Hopkins because who preceded him there and who was his partner in crime? Russ Lindsay. So as we've heard uh, in Judy's introduction, and many know Russ, uh, he obtained his BS in DVM from the University of Georgia. He then went for graduate training, receiving his master's at Auburn University and achieving the rank of assistant professor on their faculty. Then he came to Hopkins as a fellow in the pathology department. He had some idea of pursuing a PhD, but apparently that path didn't work out with Fred Bang. And so he pivoted to this NIH-sponsored position where he had research training, and this lasted for two years. And again, during this overlap, um, he and uh, uh, Ed Melby formed an incredibly formidable team to start Hopkins Comparative Medicine Group. Uh, Russ was double boarded by both ICLAM and ACVP. And uh, he left in um, 1968, as we heard, to found and uh, become the professor and chair of comparative medicine at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, Henry Baker, then a junior faculty member at Hopkins, went with him. And uh, two, they were, again, the duo that really set up University of Alabama and Birmingham. Russ knew Henry from their overlap time at Auburn, where Henry attended for his uh, DVM. And um, so uh, when Russ was at Hopkins with Ed Bellamy, they actually worked together to recruit Henry Baker to train at Johns Hopkins. And so he was one of the earliest uh, Hopkins trainees, along with uh, folks like Norm Altman, David Small, um, John Strandberg, uh, and, and a, a number of, of folks in that early era, too. So they were a work hard, play hard group, there's no doubt. And in the, in the relatively short time of five years, um, Ed, here, and, and Russ over here, uh, you know, worked in tandem to build this incredible group. They recruited a number of, number of veterinarians onto the faculty with expertise 
in pathology, such as Bob Squire and John Strandberg, as well as experts in veterinary medicine, really to build out the clinical team. Um, they also recruited basic science researchers, Lauren Aurelian, uh, in working in herpes viruses. They uh, put in three labs for comparative medicine, clinical pathology, histopathology, and a clinical microbiology lab, staffed by some of the women in, uh, shown in this portrait. And some of these uh, folks, including Barbara Yarborough, some in the room may know Barbara, but she was still running, actually, that lab when I started as a trainee at Johns Hopkins. Um, so this was uh, you know, an incredibly powerful group that they really assembled in five years. The other thing that Ed and Russ did together was write the first grants to NIH for animal resources, but they also started lab animal veterinary training with support from the NIH in the mid-60s. And uh, they also then followed, had a follow-up award to train in uh, comparative pathology too. So they really had a great strategic vision. They implemented, they had a plan, and they made it work. And uh, come the 1970s, both of those training programs in lab animal medicine and pathology finally coalesced under the T32 mechanisms um, that continue at Hopkins to this date. Ed left Hopkins in 1974 after 12 years, uh, where he became the dean at Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, the, uh, my, an interesting personal fact about me in Ed's last year was my first year in vet school at Cornell. And even though I knew him as the dean, I never knew about the Hopkins legacy till years later, which has always been a great shame. It would have been great to know about those things. So uh, moving towards today uh, and, and Hopkins Medicine's role and how we look. Um, in transition after Ed's departure, we had a series of excellent leaders. So uh, Jim Brayton, Frank Lowe, as Steve Nimi mentioned earlier, is a mentor for him. Um, John Strandberg, Janice Clements, and Chris Sink all have preceded me as directors of the department. The interesting thing that happened in 1988 was the retrovirus lab, formerly based in the Department of Neurology, moved over to comparative medicine. Now this is a really, really interesting research group at Hopkins that was studying visna in sheep is a model for the neuroinflammation that you see with multiple sclerosis. And one of those team members was Bill Narayan, a DVM PhD. He received his DVM from the Ontario Veterinary College. And he partnered with Janice Clements, the chair of neurology, Dick Johnson. Uh, and they worked in intensively in the Visna model and published a series of landmark papers in the 70s and 80s on Visna. So uh, it was a really interesting model and in fact, they knew Visna as a lentivirus that replicated, infected and replicated in macrophages, but not cause immune suppression. And you know, in the years that followed, when HIV emerged on the scene, this group uh, published a very seminal paper saying that, hey, this new virus, this HIV that causes CNS disease, that type of inflammation in this organ looks markedly like Visna in sheep. So it's not immune suppressive, but the other aspects of organ-specific damage related to replication of macrophages, hey, these link. And so Janice and uh, partners uh, at NCI, they, they all got together and collaborated uh, on a great report showing that in fact HIV was not just a retrovirus, in fact, it was a lentivirus. And the fact that it causes a disease in so many organs, as I'll show in a minute, is no surprise to veterinarians because we know all about these other lentiviruses like EIA, CAEV, and other things that causes disease such as encephalitis and arthritis and a host of other things in organs too. So again, the comparative approach. In 2003, the division became the Department of Comparative Medicine. Formally, we are now still a basic science department, a member of the Institute for Basic Biomedical Science uh, Collective at Johns Hopkins. And then finally, in 2007, the name changed to the Department of Molecular and Comparative Pathobiology. Now, I always thought this was really interesting because the rationale given at the time was that nobody understood what comparative medicine was, so this new name was surely much easier. <laughs> um, to explain what we did, in the end, all it became was a real difficulty back when people actually answered phones in the department and had to say, hello, Department of Molecular... <laughs> you know, so we had a much longer name for our enterprise, too, which, again, didn't shed much light on actually what we did. And so uh, I think over the years we've always said, you know, maybe comparative medicine is the true and the best name for the department. Um, along the way here in 2003, Research Animal Resources, uh, which was in the School of Medicine, moved administratively, or uh, it's reported... Uh, to the central university level too, and that became known as RAR, Research Animal Resources too. 
And uh, again, over the years, uh, Chris Newcomer, Bob Adams, and now Eric Hutchinson uh, serve as directors of RAR and are the AVs at Johns Hopkins. Our mission today is familiar, it's endured, it's to provide leadership in biomedical research on animal and human diseases, ensure the health and humane care of research animals. And this mission is fulfilled by the academic activities of the faculty in research, teaching, and by our clinical mission, both diagnostic investigation and animal care. Uh, what does our clinical portfolio look like these days? Well, we span all JHU divisions and sites including just a few miles down the road where Cassie Motes, a member of uh, ACLAM, uh, oversees the comparative medicine enterprise at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in Tampa. About 50% of JHU-sponsored projects have an animal component, and over uh, our census includes over 50,000 mouse and rat cages and growing, uh, as Jason Villano will tell everybody, as Director of Rodent Resources. We have over 700 primates at Hopkins, uh, including both rhesus macaques and pigtailed macaques, we have breeding colonies for both of these species. The pigtail macaque colony has been supported for a number of years by the NAH under a P40 and U42 grant mechanism. Now to provide these animals for studies primarily for HIV, uh, their SPF colonies, uh, and again, they're part of the Melby story because he actually had the vision to develop uh, a plan to where we would house these animals and maintain these essential breeding colonies over the decades. We have a number of common marmosets. They're also funded by the NIH as a production colony, uh, in part uh, based in the biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins. We have many other species, of course, as anyone who's been at Hopkins knows. Uh, pigs, rabbits, ferrets, guinea pigs, chinchillas, sheep, bats, owls, fish, lizards, you name it, every day things change. Uh, an omission from this slide are the golden Syrian hamsters and the amazing work that Jason Villano did during COVID-19 as we stood up animal studies in ABSL3 and used uh, primarily the hamsters as our main model to study SARS-CoV-2. So uh, these change, and I've, I've put pigs in bold because I know I've talked to some folks, different institutions, who also are seeing this increasing growth in their pig census and the demand for pig surgical service in particular and support because pigs now, uh, at Hopkins at least, are uh, a huge research focus for xenotransplantation purposes. So although the ultimate goal is to xenotransplant organs from pigs into people using genetically uh, modified pigs that are uh, pathogen free at some level, including CMV, um, <clears throat> the preclinical work now are doing um, transplantations from pigs to primate models right now to develop ultimately the human xenotransplantation program at Johns Hopkins. So a growing challenge for us, uh, and who would have thought that um, you know, downtown Baltimore would be the home of so many of this species for the animal models. It's quite a surprise. Uh, comparative pathology uh, continues you know, in full blast at Hopkins too as part of the clinical mission. Uh, we support RER, we support experimental pathology for Hopkins researchers. Regional vet practices, uh, the Maryland State Department of Natural Resources, Department of Agriculture, as well as our long-term partners, the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore and the National Aquarium. And uh, our pathology trainees still also rotate on the human autopsy service since they've done since the 1960s as well. So it's really the truest comparative pathology training program that I know of. Uh, and it's a wonderful uh, foundation for uh, future work in either diagnostic or experimental pathology across the board in any and all species. Our education mission also continues. Uh, we offer postdoctoral training for graduate veterinarians seeking board certification both by ACLAM and by ACVP. And since the 1960s, our, again, as I mentioned, the pathology trainees are still in autopsy service. Both tracks are three years in residency like training to confer board eligibility, but most of the trainees also seek additional research training. Uh, and um, they're either PhD candidates or actually research postdoc fellows if they come in as DVM PhDs or VMD PhDs. I mentioned that we're now in our 46 plus year of NIH T32 support to train veterinarians in biomedical research. And we also have an active T35 summer program to bring veterinary students to Hopkins to get exposure and training in um, biomedical research as well. So we've trained over 60 diplomates of ACLAM. Uh, 60 diplomates in ACVP. In the last 25 years, uh, over 30, 30 DVMs have obtained their PhDs at Johns Hopkins as well. And typically, again, in these programs, these are dual training in both the clinical discipline as well as research. Other people have, uh, who've entered as DVM PhDs, of course, have also done uh, research postdocs as well as their clinical training. 
Our research focus uh, remains in retrovirology. Uh, initially, we were very heavily focused on HIV pathogenesis, particularly in the CNS. But uh, today, our main emphasis on HIV latent reservoirs and cure. And for these studies, we use the SIV macaque model of HIV, again, targeting myeloid-derived cell reservoirs. Uh, in addition to the CD4 well uh, reservoir that has been most well characterized in HIV patients treated long term with antiretroviral therapy. Departmental expertise is broad for molecular virology, extracellular vesicles research, behavioral biology with Lydia Hopper and our team, COVID-19 certainly, and again uh, with uh, an animal model developed and supported by Jason, immunology and parasitology, and so our clinical faculty are certainly complemented by a number of uh, PhD faculty serving as PIs addressing these areas of research. So what do I do at Hopkins? Uh, so I, I did show up at Hopkins uh, from the cold, so to speak. I came in from equine practice. Um, I did both my PATH training and I did my PhD at Hopkins. And I've had uh, a very fortunate success in maintaining a, a great research portfolio studying HIV over the years in the SIV model. So HIV causes AIDS because it replicates in CD4 T cells. You lose those cells, you're immune suppressed, you can succumb to uh, opportunistic infections. As I've mentioned, HIV also replicates in macrophages. And like Visna, this is associated with damage to a number of organs, including the lung, the brain, um, the heart, cardiomyopathy, and cardiovascular manifestations, kidney, bone marrow, and what I'm going to talk a little bit about today about my science, peripheral neuropathy. So peripheral neuropathy today is the most frequent neurologic complication of HIV. And it presents as a syndrome known as DSP, distal sensory polyneuropathy, which is manifest as debilitating burning pain in both feet and sometimes in hands, so a stocking and glove distribution of syndromes. There's also been a paradoxical impact of antiretroviral treatment, particularly in the early generations of therapy. The drugs in themselves in their own right were uh, neurotoxic, and those patients treated with those drugs often developed a syndrome known as ATN, antiretroviral toxic neuropathy. So if you look at trends over time in people living with HIV who are treated, you can see that the great majority of people shown in blue have uh, low to undetectable virus uh, after starting antiretroviral treatment. Despite this success in controlling the virus, though, uh, you see that neuropathy signs uh, persist and, in fact, even increase over time in these cohorts of suppressed HIV individuals on therapy. So this continues to be a major clinical problem to address. Uh, it's not life-threatening, but it's extremely debilitating to people to, still to this day. And again, as the HIV cohort expands, more people are on treatment and the, the cohort also ages. We expect that the neuro neuropathy issue is going to increase in severity. So uh, to study the pathogenesis of HIV PNS disease, you must look at the somatosensory pain pathway from the bare epidermal nerve fibers that are in the skin uh, <clears throat> to um, their axons that project through the peripheral nerves to the neuronal cell bodies and somatosensory ganglia. Here's the dorsal root ganglia. These same cells and neurons then send axons up to dorsal horn lamina 1 and 2, where they finally synapse with ascending pathways to spinothalamic uh, regions in uh, the central nervous system, too. So uh, we study um, all of these different parts of the pathways. In addition to skin, we also study the cornea. And uh, I'll show you the reasons there. But if you sort of think about what the most densely innervated part of your body is, and someone offers to poke you with a sharp pencil, you would probably say, don't poke me in the eye. Whereas if I said, well, let me poke you in the skin around your ankle, you'd probably say, OK, that's not so bad. You'd make the choice. Yeah, it goes somewhere else, too. So the cornea has been of specific interest, as I'll show, because of the density of the nerves. And again, its ganglia, where um, it sends signal, is the trigeminal ganglia. So if I uh, mention trigeminal ganglia and DRG together, it's because they're serving equivalent functional roles in the system. So uh, Anita Trichelle will tell you about this model because when I was a graduate student and she was training at Tulane, we worked uh, on this project. Uh, this was an SIV model of HIV neurologic disease because there wasn't a readily reproducible SIV model. In this model, we inoculated uh, macaques with two viruses, a cloned molecular neurovirulent SIV, SIV 17EFR, and an immunosuppressive swarm. And by putting it into pigtailed macaques, 
We developed a model in which the animals uh, had AIDS three months post-inoculation, and most of those animals had prototypic SAV encephalitis by that time point. So it's been our bread and butter model of HIV-induced neurologic uh, disease for decades now. And again, it was developed in collaboration uh, with Anita Treshell and collaborator Tulane initially. This is an H&E of a DRG. The upper left panel is a normal animal. Could be a person. I couldn't tell you the difference between the two. The large pink cells are the neurons themselves. Um, and they're surrounded by a necklace of satellite cells. They're glial-like cells that have trophic and metabolic roles in sustaining uh, the neurons. Scattered out here in the interstitium are resident tissue macrophages. Uh, when you infect animals with either a with SIV or you compare with HIV-infected individuals shown in the upper right panel, uh, there's a pronounced mononuclear cell infiltrate of ganglionitis, and there's loss of these sensory neurons, those large uh, eosinophil stain cells. At higher mag, you can see neuronophagia, and finally, overt replacement of the sensory neurons in the ganglia in both people and in the macaques infected with SIV um, by these structures called nodules of Nijot, combination of uh, fibroblasts, uh, other long-term residual innate immune cells, then uh, connective tissue that replace the neurons. So looking at and comparing the pathology uh, between humans and the SAV macaques, we said, okay, we've got the phenotype matched here, at least in terms of pathology. We also looked for replication in the ganglia, and like HIV and SIV infection, you can find viral protein uh, in these interstitial cells in between the neurons in the ganglia, shown by immunohistochemistry. You can find it by riboprobe uh, RNA uh, in situ hybridization, done in collaboration with Todd Reinhardt when he was at Pittsburgh, confirming that SIV RNA is also in the ganglia. And finally, in the control animals, we don't see signal for either technique. SIV, like HIV, co-localizes to macrophages, shown by immunostaining for IBA1, a macrophage marker. And finally, the joined image here in yellow shows both uh, SIV within these macrophages in the ganglia, too. So again, it matches the HIV story. These animals, though, don't have a clinical phenotype. They don't develop pain. And we think that's because it's a fast, accelerated model, too. We see the precedence, the early PNS damage, but we don't see that longer-term clinical uh, phenomenon in these animals. <coughs> If you're a neurologist and you're looking at neuropathies, uh, one of the best tools you can do, uh, you use now um, to look at damage, is epidermal nerve fiber loss. This occurs in HIV, uh, acute toxic neuropathy. It also occurs in non-infectious conditions, include chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy and in diabetic neuropathy, probably the neuropathy we're all most familiar with in the room, too. But those other parts of the somatosensory pathway are much more difficult to study. Nerve conduction studies, for example, in peripheral nerves, because you're looking at these very small, thin, eye-myelinated C-fibers, the nerve conduction velocity studies have not been very helpful in the clinics. This is the Hopkins team that developed a skin biopsy technique to detect loss of epidermal nerve fiber density. <clears throat> so Justin MacArthur, Jack Griffin, uh, current and previous chair of neurology at Hopkins, and Pete Hauer, an outstanding technician, of course, worked to develop this technique. And you see there's a factual inaccuracy in this picture. I think I picked up on that at everybody. I think everybody was laughing because, of course, you wouldn't biopsy mid-leg. You'd biopsy down here at the ankle. And he has his socks up. That makes no sense. These are actually three millimeter circular skin punches. They're very, very small. The, the biopsies are invasive, but they're done under uh, just lidocaine anesthesia. Um, the processing and workup is relatively straightforward, and skin labs now use this technique throughout the world to track uh, early damage to the sensory nerves uh, in a variety of conditions, too, pioneered by our colleagues and collaborators at Hopkins. So, um, you know, when we looked at the epidermis in the monkeys, we found similarly that uh, SIV infection reduces epidermal nerve fiber density, too. You can see versus the infected control animal on the left with multiple uh, nerve fibers stained red by uh, immunostaining for PGP 9.5, a panoxonal marker. And you can see one single fiber in the panel on the right in an animal that's uh, in chronic stages of SIV infection. So we were, again, able to translate not just the DRG pathology, but also uh, the loss of epidermal nerve fibers that have been shown in HIV clinic to really set up the significance and import of the SIV model for PNS damage. Uh, we looked at a number of animals who were uh, groups of animals who are euthanized uh, sequentially uh, post early inoculation with SAV using techniques that we developed to measure epidermal nerve fibers. And you can see here, 
At, at day seven and day 10, the ENF densities look the same in the monkeys, but they fall off precipitously as early as two weeks post-infection, and they're sustained out through 35 days post-infection. And this is really telling data, because if you're ever gonna really wanna uh, work to make uh, life better for people with neuropathy, you wanna prevent it. It's like Alzheimer's, you don't wanna treat it, you wanna really prevent it. And so this is very telling, and no one really knew that the damage could really take hold so early in infection. And if we're gonna actually intervene, develop novel therapeutics, this is the time to work on this. And again, that 14-day time point was very telling. The limitations of skin biopsy are that it's invasive, it requires extensive processing, it's also difficult to track change over time in an individual animal. We take samples from the plantar pad of the pigtailed macaques, and you know, once you've taken a sample, it's really hard to go back and resample that same area. You're just, uh, you've already disturbed the area, you've disturbed the vasculature, the innervation. So it's not really practical within an individual animal on study to, uh, to do repeat skin biopsies too. And it's also technically challenging the animals to count the epidermal nerve fibers. It's the reason we don't use the skin around the ankle, but we use the, the pad too because of the adnexa and the density of uh, the follicles. So we actually use unbiased urology, which is much more complicated than simply counting the number of nerve fibers that cross the dermal epidermal junction uh, as is done in, in uh, human clinical skin labs. So the macaques presented additional challenges. So I mentioned the cornea. So the cornea has a, an incredibly rich sensory nerve plexus that's located just under the epithelium. This is a five millimeter central corneal nerve punch from a macaque and necropsy. It's immunostained for beta-3 tubulin shown in green. And it's just an incredible structure. And uh, it has this fascinating central whorl. The structure is present in uh, humans as well and a number of other species in a publication that we actually worked at with Carl Murford at Indiana University. And so this is an incredible spot to look for uh, sensory nerve damage as well. Uh, the picture on the left shows uh, a long-term non-progressing animal infected with SIV. The picture on the right shows uh, clearly that with progression to chronic SIV in this animal, you have loss of the density of these fibers and changes in the architecture of them in that subbasal plexus. And so we published this and we picked up a key collaborator on the way because I had no idea how to count these nerve fibers or to explain those changes in the architecture. So we partnered with a group called Voxeleron, a company led by principals Jonathan Oakley and Daniel Rusikoff, and they're experts in image analysis, particularly in the eye. And they came up with extraordinary new algorithms and ways to count these changes in the nerve fibers. So we really didn't start with the intent that we were gonna have one-eyed monkeys on study. Uh, we didn't think that anybody in the clinics was ever going to you know, think that corneal biopsy was the way to work on their neuropathy. What we really wanted to do was to adapt a technique called in vivo corneal confocal microscopy to the SAV model. Here's the platform hardware from Heidelberg. Uh, in this uh, microscope, essentially, um, it comes to the patient's side. You put your chin here, you rest your forehead against the top of it, and then this objective mounted horizontally is gently opposed to your cornea after you've received topical anesthesia, and it's guided by this little video camera mounted on the right. Here's this machine in action, thanks to a grant from the Blaustein Pain Foundation to our group. Uh, we put this to uh, work in the macaque model. So on the left, you see that objective carefully coming up to the macaque's eye because you just want very, the most minimal and gentle of contact. And then it's guided on the screen too, and we can see the images we're starting to collect as we uh, go in and out to achieve subepithelial depth to capture the plexus. And this is typical of the image of the nerve fibers we actually capture. No staining, it's simply topical anesthesia, put the objective to the eye and uh, grab the images too from the central cornea. Uh, sounds easy, it's a little more difficult of course because um, if I just go back a second, uh, we can't tell the monkeys to put your chin here and lean down and do all that work, um, though we're hoping the behavioral folks will get us there one day. But in fact, uh, many members of the Hopkins lab animal community and staff helped us really develop techniques to hold the anesthetized macaque and hold them in a stable position oriented such that we could actually do these studies. So Bob Adams, Jess Izzy in particular, one of our veterinary faculty and Eklund diplomat at Hopkins, a number of trainees were, uh, shall I say, conscripted into doing this for our studies as well, and were very helpful as we developed this technique. So uh, our challenges were really image acquisition, quality and location, processing these images that tend to be noisier in the monkeys versus people because the uh, radius of curvature of the monkey's eye is much more acute and so we're, not get, we're getting more of a um, noise at the end of the images. And then finally, how do we put some measurements to these uh, captured images? 
So um, grab an image shown on the left. Uh, the traditional method, of course, has been manual nerve tracing using programs such as Neuron-J. And the group in the University of Auckland in New Zealand are the best manual tracers in the world. And in fact, they, uh, even uh, their principal, Studi Misra, came to Hopkins to teach us how to do confocal microscopy in the macaques. Uh, and she also showed us how they do their manual nerve tracing. But this is a semi-objective technique. It varies between tracers, and it takes a lot of time to do it. So our objective was actually to develop a computer algorithm that did it immediately in milliseconds that was completely objective and actually could sort of see through the haze to improve signal-noise ratio in the monkeys. So in collaboration with Jonathan Oakley, we built a convolutional neural network. This is our first foray into AI and deep learning. And we trained the algorithm on 40 images from macaques after we captured the images and then uh, traced, uh, traced the nerves ourselves. So we used this as the training set. And then we had a testing set of 46 images from different animals as well. And we took those images and we ran them through this algorithm, which we termed deep nerve, to generate a nerve probability or prediction map in the system. So now the process is grab the image, throw it into uh, deep nerve as a system, and you get immediate results for a number of parameters, including uh, corneal nerve fiber density and length. And so again, it just cleans up. These are representative images from the monkey. It cleans them up rapidly uh, from the animals in all the panels shown in the right subdivided areas. And uh, we finally put it into action. Here's a study of 12 animals who were infected with SIV uh, and then euthanized 10 days post-infection. And um, this shows the images that we grabbed in each individual animal pre-infection uh, in these two, two panels on the left. Sorry, this is the pre-infection, and then this is the post-infection scan. And this is the raw scan image right off the confocal microscope. But after we run it through deep nerve processing, you can see it markedly cleans up. And it's just amazing how it can see through the various noise and artifacts to get these images. And what we found here was that 10 of the 12 animals had significant reductions in corneal nerve fiber length by 10 days post-infection with SAV. So we actually trumped our earlier ENF findings of 10 days. We know the damage is occurring yet even earlier. We then went back to the Department of Ophthalmology and Studio Minister at Auckland, and we put Deep Nerve into action using their previously traced manual images in a large diabetic cohort. And what we found, just focusing on the bottom here and the final version that we're using of Deep Nerve right now, we looked at comparison between three of the best manual tracers in the world versus Deep Nerve's predictions. And uh, the correlations were amazing, you know, from 0 0.86, 0 0.94 to 0.92. In a biological system, that's incredible. It clearly distinguished everybody with diabetes shown in the Red Crosses versus all of the control human subjects as well, too. So it's a great example of the bidirectionality of a translational science in this group. Uh, it's now been used for study of multiple sclerosis. It's been used uh, in a chemotherapeutic induced peripheral neuropathy study. And we're just bringing out a paper uh, with Studio Misra as a lead on actually recovery of corneal sensory nerve fibers uh, measured by deep nerve in patients with type 2 diabetes who've had bariatric surgery. So it's receiving, you know, um, ever widening clinical application as well. So again, it's an excellent non-invasive tool for detecting sensory nerve fiber loss. Uh, the finally, you know, getting into the AI game really enhanced the value of CM. And you get to the point where you wonder, well, where's the real truth? Is it actually deep nerve or is it those other manual tracers? And that sort of gets to be one of these fundamental debates in pathology right now is can I really seed my diagnostic human to some algorithm that's looking at these slides? You know, when is the algorithm better than the person? And it gets to be a really interesting and often feeling driven as well as a fact driven process. Uh, corneal nerve fiber assessments, again, as I mentioned, are used in a number of other neurodegenerative conditions, including long-term COVID now as well. And again, I mentioned that translational search is really a two-way street, and it really accelerates the refinement, both for the research and at bedside for the patient's best care. Today, we're moving into big data. We're doing a lot of single nucleus seek projects. Um, uh, I just had a PhD student, uh, pathologist Katie Malka finish. She's headed to University of Pennsylvania next week. And she's been really spearheading now looking at uh, the trans global transcriptome changes in the peripheral nervous system during SAV infection. Again, studies that we can't do in HIV-infected patients. And she can pull out, uh, by isolating nuclei from macaque tissue, she can pull out um, multiple subsets of neurons, all of the glial subsets, astrocytes, oligogonidoglia, precursors, microglia, endothelial cells, parasites. 
And again, and then look at changes in transcriptomic profiling over time when we infect animals with SAV. So it's like our next step now, and moving beyond AI, and now we move into the big data omics piece of this as well, too. It's where the science is going, and it's where we have to really be cognizant of uh, being aware of these new uh, approaches. So um, the dome is still in Baltimore, East Baltimore. It's surrounded by a huge medical complex today. Um, I'll point you quickly to the Bladelock building over here where the elevator story was told. And this small little building attached to it, which is right across from our department and RER, this is the Brady building for anyone who's been at Hopkins. And today, uh, we now have taken down the Brady building and we're building in a new research building that's going to include a substantial vivarium space and yet even more operating rooms too. Uh, it would be especially useful to help support the xenotransplantation effort at Hopkins. So um, briefly, uh, in the next hour, I would like to talk about the next 100 years. <laughs> So we should embrace our role as catalysts in research, as I started this talk with. We should strive to understand and implement emerging technology and be partners in integrated team science. You know, we should know about the opportunities in big data and AI. We don't have to be the programmers. We need to be able to talk with those people and work together in teams. That's where the real synergy is, and we really need to strive that in comparative medicine. We need to anticipate change and adapt. Well, I put this picture back up from 1900 of the hospital. And so this really was the horse and buggy era, and I think uh, the people who've talked about their equine past here will agree that there's ample evidence that horses were on the street. <laughs> Furthermore, I couldn't find a picture of a hybrid here, but I found an EV. Here's an electric streetcar running on the streetcar lines in 1900 in Baltimore, too. So, you know, um, people in medicine uh, and people fond of comparative approaches have faced many challenges and transformative challenges over the year. Who knew that a few short years later they were facing uh, the great flu pandemic, for example, too. So um, we need to anticipate change. And like during COVID, we're ready to adapt and really excel to serve the world during these times. So uh, take the time to pause and reflect on our incredibly good fortune to stand on the shoulders of giants like Russ Lindsay and Ed Melby as we head into our next 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Minkowski, for this great lecture. I don't know if there, I know we're right up against the time for lunch, and he's standing between you and lunch, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free.